Welcome to another tutorial by Chronect. This time we're covering Radiant GI for the built-in pipeline. Let's check it out. After importing the Radiant GI package into your project, you can now add Radiant to your scene by going to Game Object, Create Other, Radiant GI, and picking Radiant Volume. Now select the Radiant Volume object and create a new profile, or select one of the already made ones. The profile stores all the Radiant GI parameters so you can customize the effect as you see fit. There is a final step you need to do in order to get Radiant into your project. Go to the main camera and add the Radiant Global Illumination script. Now you are ready to use Radiant GI in your own scene. But for this tutorial we will check out the included demo called Atrium. Once the scene is open, pick the Radiant GI volume object and let's check it out. The profile is divided into six sections, general, quality, fallbacks, performance, artistic controls, and debug. Let's go through these sections one by one. Indirect intensity controls the intensity of the bounce light. You can see that as I change the value, the light becomes more or less bright. Distance attenuation controls how much intensity the light loses as it moves further away from its source. One extra bounce will give you an extra bounce from the previous frame for free. Max source brightness lets you clamp or limit the brightness for the reflecting surfaces. Very bright spots like emissive pixels can add a lot of noise, so you can reduce that by clamping the value. Normal map influence enhances lighting on surfaces with normal maps. Luma influence is used in the forward rendering mode to compensate for missing albedo data. You can switch that by going to your camera and going from deferred to forward. We do suggest using deferred mode though. Now let's enable virtual emitters and see what they do. Pick an object and add the virtual emitter component to it and adjust the settings. Now the object can affect the Radiant GI solution even if it isn't present in the viewport, which is the limitation of screen space effects. Now let me undo this real quick and get back to it. Now before we go through the quality settings, Let's change our debug view to raycast. Now we can see the changes. So ray count changes the amount of rays cast. Max distance changes the distance the rays travel. Max samples changes the amount of samples along the ray. Higher values means more accurate results. Jittering adds some randomization to avoid banding. Thickness changes the tolerance used to determine whether ray hits a surface. Binary search enables a refinement of the hit position, producing more accurate results. Smoothing specifies the amount and intensity of blur to reduce noise. Now in order to check out what the temporal filter does, we have to change our debug view to temporal accumulation buffer. Then press play. The temporal filter uses velocity buffers and reprojection to accumulate hits over frames and produce a more pleasant and smooth result it's recommended that this option is enabled. Response speed refers to how fast the spatio-temporal filter will react to changes in the scene. A lower value will produce softer results but can introduce ghosting. Chroma threshold determines the maximum color difference of the current image with regards to the history buffers. If the threshold is exceeded, the history buffer is clamped to reduce noise. The same thing happens with the next option, just according to camera position. Now let's check out the fallback mode section. Reuse Rays allows Radiant GI to reuse rays from previous frames to cover areas that haven't had the hit ray in this frame. Let's enter play mode to check out how this works. You can see the amount of rays changes dramatically when I enable and disable this option. Intensity controls the intensity of those rays. The depth rejection value rejects rays that are too far away from the previous result. We'll skip the reflection probe fallback for now but we'll move on to the shadow map fallback. In order to use it, we have to pick our directional light and add the radiant shadow map component. You will see the improvement in the result immediately. This technique allows us to use data from the directional light's point of view and improve the result accordingly. Now moving on to the performance section, we can improve performance by reducing the ray tracer accuracy. And we have a slider here that allows us to do so. Downsampling allows us to downscale the input image affecting all render passes, so the entire effect execution is faster. Moving on to the artistic control section, we can see brightness threshold which determines the minimum brightness taken into account for global illumination. Then maximum brightness which clamps the result of the GI, and saturation which changes the saturation of the GI. 
In order for the limit to volume bounds option to work, you have to change the mode at the topmost drop down to local. And finally, the debug section. We have been using the compare mode view for all this tutorial, and we can disable it here. We can also disable same side, which will allow us to see the radiant GI effect on the entire scene. You can also use panning to move left or right with the camera. The last thing to do is check out the reflection probes fallback. We have a scene set up that uses it. Let's open the Cornell box demo and check it out. Now you can see that when I press play, suddenly the scene is illuminated. Now if I check out the camera, under the camera there is a reflection probe. You can see in the radiant volume settings that I can enable and disable the reflection probe fallback and the result changes. Play around with the demo scenes yourself to figure out what everything does and don't forget to check out the online documentation. There's a link to it in the documentation folder. Don't forget to like and subscribe to get notified when we drop more tutorials like this one.